Welcome to the Reef Resilience webinar, Preparing for Coral Bleaching Outlook and Lessons in Monitoring and Response. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Aurora Justiniano. I'm the Caribbean Coordinator for the Nature Conservancy's Reef Resilience Network and your host for today. This webinar is brought to you through the support of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be one hour, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentations. There are two ways participants can ask questions. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions, and we will keep track of this for the end of the presentation. Or you can raise your hand during the question session of the webinar, and I will take your questions during that time. You can raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon toolbar on the left of your name. If you're having technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, you can send us a message via the chat box, and we'll try to resolve the issue. And before I introduce our first presenter, we would like to ask you a question. Have you seen coral bleaching at your site now or in the past? You can either respond yes or no. I will give you a few seconds to respond to this question and then we'll tell your responses. So, thanks for participating in the poll. Um, it looks like we have a lot of sites with bleaching this year. And today, we have two great presenters. We have Dr. Mark Aiken and Chris Berg. Thank you both for presenting. And now I would like to introduce and welcome our first speaker, Dr. Mark Aiken. Mark has worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for over 20 years and directs Coral Reef Watch, a program that monitors coral reef ecosystems through satellite and in-water observation. He publishes on coral reef ecology, especially the impacts of climate change on coral reefs, coral bleaching, ocean acidification, oil spills, and the behavior of marine organisms. He has testified before the U.S. Congress on the impacts of climate change and was a contributing author on the 2014 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Report. Our second speaker today is the Nature Conservancy's South Florida Conservation Director, Chris Berg. Chris was raised in the Florida Keys and studied environmental conservation in Florida and Arizona prior to beginning a career that spans from nature preserve management to urban concentration strategy development. In 2005, he helped initiate the Florida Reef Resilience Program, an interdisciplinary partnership among coral reef managers, scientists, other NGOs, and business designed to help Florida's reef cope with climate change and he has overseen the Conservancy's partnership-based coral reef restoration efforts. He serves on the Monroe County Climate Change Advisory Committee, the Southeast and Caribbean Climate Community of Practice Steering Committee, and the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact Staff Steering Committee. And now I would like to pass it over to Mark to begin his presentation. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Let me get the slides up. And hopefully on my screen you are seeing the presentation.
Can you see my presentation yet? Yes, we're seeing it. Okay, great. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, glad to have you with us, and I'm sorry that we're going to be talking about such a, uh, an unfortunate event as what's going on. Uh, the bleaching event that is now going on started actually in 2014, and I'll get to that in just a moment. It's been going on throughout 2015 and is expected to continue into 2016. And uh, there's a possibility that 2016 may be even worse for so many areas than 2014 has been. So first what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through and I'll talk about what the event has been doing so far, get us up to speed of, on where we are, and, and then speak a bit about what we expect bleaching to be doing in uh, 2016 especially the first area that's going to be hit, which is going to be the Southern Hemisphere. So this event started actually in uh, the, the latter half of 2014, around June of 2014, in Guam and the Mariana Archipelago in the central western Pacific. Um, the ble bleaching that occurred in, in Guam, and especially up in the northern part of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, was the worst that they've seen. Uh, it was following, falling on the heels of another bleaching event that had happened in 2013. And so what we're seeing in 2014 was actually a part of back-to-back -back bleaching events. And you're going to start noticing a pattern here about these back-to-back -back bleaching events. Before that had settled down, because it lasted for a long time, the water started to warm in Hawaii especially in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands out in the uh, Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, especially around an island called Lisiansky Island, where the thermal stress got up to about 18 degree weeks of stress, which was exceedingly high, and the bleaching was severe. While that was going on, there was also bleaching going on in the Florida Keys. 2014 um, uh, was not a strong, broadly uh, distributed Caribbean event, but was seen in the Florida Keys, and in fact, 2014 was stronger than 2015. Uh, the next of those back-to-back -back events I'll mention. Um, in 2014, we had strong bleaching in the Keys, both the lower Keys and the upper Keys, and a bit of bleaching in southeast Florida. And when all of that had passed, and the sun started getting closer to the equator, we started seeing bleaching in the Marshall Islands, and they saw the worst bleaching that they had ever seen. Well, we moved on into 2015, and the first half of 2015, while the sun is over the southern hemisphere, we were seeing bleaching in the South Pacific. Started around the uh, Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Then uh, this warming patch that you see here started around Fiji and the Samoas, where the, uh, the bleaching in American Samoa was the worst that they've ever seen, and rather devastating. I'll show you some slides of that in just a moment. Um, that was early in 2015, and then the El Nino that we're in now really started firing up, and we started getting this warming across through the Central Pacific, and the, the extreme warm temperatures started to extend from Kiribati across from the Pacific to the Eastern uh, Pacific, and uh, colliding with the ca coast of South America, and we were seeing high thermal stress and uh, some bleaching in the Galapagos, and a, a lot of bleaching in Panama. Now, all of these charts you'll be seeing are using our, uh, our bleaching alert area uh, scale, which means that the, the blue or light blue or white is uh, no stress. Yellow means a bleaching watch, or it means that hot spots are present. A bleaching warning means that we have reached the point that it's one degree above the normal warmest temperatures of the year, so we, we're starting to, to accumulate degree heating weeks. And at, at four degree heating weeks, we reach the alert level one, which is significant bleaching, and alert level two, where there's widespread bleaching and uh, significant mortality uh, in most places where that occurs. So that was the first part of 2015 in the Pacific, but at the same time as that was still going on, in uh, sort of the, the April to June time frame, we started seeing bleaching going on in the Indian Ocean. The warming here was not as high, although that may be related to some things, uh, uh, some details about our, our new five kilometer products, but they also just may have been more sensitive. And there was bleaching seen in the Chagos, or the British Indian Ocean Territory, whichever name you want to go by, 
as well as up in the Maldives. That warring continued as, as, and moved to the northeast, as they often do. We had some warming and some bleaching in uh, Indonesia and uh, the Philippines and parts of Southeast Asia. Not too severe at that point, fortunately. But we, you know, at this point, we've now had bleaching in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean in 2015. Well, 2015 continue, continues on. We get into the second half. We're continuing to see bleaching in the Kiribati. We're, we start to see bleaching in Hawaii. This is the different from last year in that rather than being really concentrated in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, the bleaching was seen in the main Hawaiian Islands. Now that had been had occurred in 2014 as well. This is the next of our back-to-back -back bleaching events we've been seeing in this uh, series. Um, but the, the bleaching was not very severe in 2014 and was mostly restricted to individual bays and, and uh, smaller inshore areas. In 2015, though, it was much more extensive, and we also started to see bleaching in the Caribbean. Going in detail, what was seen in Hawaii, uh, again, mostly in the main Hawaiian islands this time, uh, the strongest bleaching has been seen around the Big Island and around Maui, but it's also been quite extensive uh, around Oahu, especially windward Oahu, and up in uh, Kauai. So all of the main Hawaiian islands were seeing bleaching this time. Not so bad in the northwest uh, as what we'd seen previously. Here you see a couple of images. This is on Oahu, and you're looking at the bleaching was so severe in Kaneohe Bay that you're looking at uh, bleaching from stand up paddleboard uh, as, as uh, Rusty Brainerd was paddling through and looking down to see how things were. This in Maui is an especially heartbreaking sight. If you can't quite tell, that is not a live coral. That is a coral known as Big Mama in Maui and uh, the Olawalu Reef. That coral has now reached about 90% mortality. About 90% of the live tissue that was on that coral earlier this year has bleached and has now died. And what you're seeing there is a coral that is mostly covered with algae. Uh, growing on the dead surfaces of that coral. Extensive bleaching around Maui and uh, many parts of the Big Island that have been just absolutely heartbreaking. In, again, in late 2015, starting in sort of the uh, August time frame especially, we started getting reports of bleaching up in the Northern Caribbean. Bleaching reports came in from Florida. You see a picture here of uh, some bleaching in the lower Florida Keys on one of the nurseries. It was uh, throughout the Florida Keys, as well as in Southeast Florida, not as severe as last year, but what was bad was in Southeast Florida, the onset of a, a, a major um, uh, episode of uh, coral disease going up and down the Southeast Florida coast. We started seeing bleaching along the north and south coast of Cuba. Uh, reports of bleaching have been coming in recently from the Cayman Islands fairly significant bleaching going on there. You can see one image from there. There's been bleaching in the uh, Bahamas, the Turks and Caicos, um, in both Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, a bit of bleaching starting in a few spots in Puerto Rico and the uh, Virgin Islands, not looking too bad so far. And we've also started to see a little bit of bleaching over in Bonaire, which is rather surprising uh, that that started a few weeks ago. So with the, at this point, we had bleaching in the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Caribbean uh, during uh, 2015. So uh, we issued a report indicating that this is indeed a, a, another global bleaching event. Um, it has not hit all reefs in the world, but it has reef, hit reefs in all three main ocean basins, thus giving it that global extent. This is one shot from uh, American Samoa. This is uh, the flower pot reef. You can see on the left what, how it looked in December of 2014, and on the right how it looked in February of 2015, just a few months later. Fortunately, that reef recovered fairly well. The airport reef suffered even greater bleaching and widespread mortality. So some places have seen a lot of mortality from this event. Others, we've seen some recovery going on, and we're always thankful when we do see that recovery. To recap, from June of 2014 through what we expect to occur by the end of this year, uh, we're, we think that we're going to be seeing about 30% of reefs worldwide exposed to alert level, alert level two conditions. 
99% of the coral reefs around the world have been hit with thermal stress of some sort. The U.S. has been hit disproportionately in this event with 70% uh, of U.S. reefs reaching alert level one or two and all of them being stressed. So what's going on now? Let's, let's, let's look at the situations currently now that we've moved beyond this event. Right now the main heating as you see here is in the central Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's been cooling around Hawaii and the northern Caribbean. We'll go basin by basin and you see that right now the, the highest heating in the Caribbean is actually in the uh, southwestern Caribbean, extreme western Atlantic down here uh, from uh, uh, Nicaragua down to um, uh, the Colombian coast. Uh, we have seen uh, gotten some reports of bleaching from Honduras, uh, not too far from there. As we go across to the Pacific, again, the uh, the water is cooling now around Hawaii. Thankfully, Kiribati is continuing to see uh, prolonged high temperatures, and we expect that to continue for quite some time into the future. They're really getting just severe uh, stress uh, out in that area. The Indian Ocean, oops, excuse me. The Indian Ocean is not looking too bad at this point. It's still uh, uh, the sort of the winter season, the cool season there. We've got a little bit of warmth off of India, uh, but this is an area we're looking for warming in the in the near future. So what about the future? Well, the big driver right now is the El Nino that's going on, and whenever we've had large El Ninos. Uh, they've had a, a, a pattern that has started in the Pacific Ocean, then been picked up in the Indian Ocean, and then later in the Caribbean. And so we're expecting to see that in 2016 as a part of this event. This is a, the latest forecast uh, plume diagrams from uh, uh, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society and the NOAA uh, Climate Prediction Center. And what you can see here is that they are basically saying that from now until early 2016, there's a 100% chance of El Nino conditions. This El Nino is going to be with us for a while yet. It doesn't start to break down in the, the models until sometime in the April to May time frame, at which point we begin to go back into normal conditions. They're not currently predicting a move into a La Nina, but to be honest, the models wouldn't are, really aren't able to pick up something like that this far out anyway. So you know, stay tuned whether this is going to do a quick switch into a La Nina like happened in uh, 97 and 98. Now uh, here's the plume of the models themselves showing how strong this event is. These are multiple different models and different models have different sensitivities and, and tendency to pick up El Ninos, but clearly all of them are showing that we're, we're in El Nino conditions now. Some show us uh, dropping out of it a little sooner than others. The consensus of the models, this yellow line and through here, shows that we're going to continue with an El Nino that's going to be close to the severity of the 97-98 event. And then we'll start to uh, deteriorate uh, as we get early into the, uh, the next year. But we won't drop out of El Nino conditions uh, for several months after that. So what does that mean for the corals? Well, let's look at our standard uh, four-month outlook from the uh, our, our bleaching thermal stress uh, four-month outlook product. And this is based on NOAA INSEP climate models, so some of the same models that were used in that previous image um, to predict El Nino. And we use the sea surface temperatures from that model to tell us what's going on, uh, what's likely to go on in the next several months. Uh, we've got that coupled with the uh, same back end as the, the, what we use for the satellite data for looking at current conditions. And here you're seeing, again, the white is no stress up to the darkest red is alert level two. You're, we're seeing some indication that there'll be some continued stress in the southern part of the Caribbean. We're not seeing a lot of stress elsewhere. It's mostly just bleaching watches. So we think we're in fairly good shape uh, in, in that area. The Pacific, on the other hand, and, oh, let me just, while, we're, while we have that previous one, let me go back and uh, say that what we are expecting is standard El Nino conditions, continued warm water, and potentially uh, uh, bleaching in the areas uh, around Panama and into Costa Rica and such. 
here that's the the northern part of what you were seeing here that's this tongue of warm water coming across to the uh, eastern tropical pacific that you normally see during an el nino we're expecting that going on through february we'll continue to see this large area of warming in the uh, central pacific continuing to affect the kiribati getting down into some of the south pacific islands uh, including parts of Polynesia, perhaps getting into the Samoas. We'll, we'll just have to see how far south this gets. Um, uh, the, the model is, uh, is good at giving us general patterns, but don't, wor don't look too closely right at the edges. You know, it's more important to look at where the, the main areas of warming are to get an idea of, of what may happen. We also are expecting warming to start in the western Pacific from uh, uh, Papua New Guinea and the Solomons down south, perhaps getting some, uh, some strong bleaching going on on the northern Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the model is looking stronger for bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef now than it was uh, just a few weeks ago. And we're also expecting to pick, a, pick up some potential for bleaching to the west. And that takes us to the Indian Ocean story. And there what you're seeing is through February, uh, bleaching in the, the southern in Indonesia region, um, the northern part of uh, Western Australia, and starting to get some warming around uh, the, the eastern islands of Africa and uh, the African coast, as well as a bit in the central Indian Ocean. Not too bad, though, but the concern here is that normally the worst of what we see is later on in the year. I'll get to that in just a second. I just want to remind folks that you can also look at the details of this, break down that four-month outlook on a week-by-week -week basis on our website. And here you can see, for example, the next two weeks of, uh, of warming uh, in that model output run. Looking at uh, a couple of areas in, uh, in particular, this is zooming in at um, Australia. Here you see only getting to alert level one in the, next, uh, in the nine to 12 week period. It hits um, uh, alert level two in the next frame after that, the 13 to 16 week period. So we're a little ways off at this point from bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, on Western Australia and in the area of uh, Southern Indonesia around um, uh, Nusa Tenggara, we're expecting to see a buildup of thermal stress that we were seeing a moment ago. Again, these are, are uh, regional uh, virtual stations. You can go into these for any area you're concerned about. Watch what's going on. Look at it in a in a month by month basis for the next few months, as well as of course uh, zooming in on on uh, later outlooks, etc. Well, something that we normally don't do, but we are this year because of this very strong El Nino, is providing in information on the la the longer range outlook from the models. Uh, the models usually are only strongly predictive out to about four months. We start to lose skill after that. But when you have a really strong El Nino event, the skill increases dramatically. And with this strong El Nino, we, we expect that this is giving us a good indication of what's, uh, what we're going to be seeing in uh, the first half of 2016. So this is looking roughly out through May of 2016. Warming, and, and these charts also are showing the maximum throughout that period. So this won't continue the entire time but these are areas that you have to watch out for high stress. Eastern Pacific, especially uh, around the Galapagos and uh, uh, Ecuador to, uh, uh, to Panama and Costa Rica. Uh, in the Central Pacific, continued stress in uh, Kiribati. Um, some stress in the northern part of the South Pacific, getting down into Polynesia, uh, the Samoas. Um, perhaps getting some of Fiji, we'll see. Uh, but reaching across here to the area around um, Papua New Guinea, the Solomons. And now what you see, the very different from the last one, is Indian Ocean is really lit up. The reason is because the strongest bleaching in the Indian Ocean really kicks in about April and continues then until um, uh, it moves into the South, uh, Southeast Asia and the, the Coral Triangle in the May, June, July time frame. And so as you normally would expect to see with a large El Nino, we're seeing patterns that say uh, we're absolutely uh, expecting to see significant bleaching throughout uh, the Indian Ocean. All of the Indian Ocean sites should be uh, prepared uh, for a coming bleaching event. 
And with this pattern coming on uh, at that scale, you would usually expect to start to see warming coming in again in the Caribbean um, starting in uh, mid middle of 2016 and going through about um, uh, November, depending on the region. And in fact, one thing that we're just starting to pick up is e showing even in May the suggestion that we'll start to we'll already be starting to see that warming in the Caribbean. Uh, so that's very troubling, but it, it goes right along with what we're expecting based on past El Nino examples. One thing I want to make sure folks realize is don't stop with your bleaching observations just because the corals have recovered. This is a story from what happened in Hawaii last year in the 2014 bleaching. By January, they were showing signs of recovery. They were happy that the corals were improving. And then within just a few weeks, they started seeing uh, disease setting in. And this may be part of what we're seeing in Florida right now with the thermal stress of last year. Uh, and then again, a warm winter and more thermal stress this year, uh, leading to disease kicking in in Florida. So the last thing I wanted to, to raise is we really want your reports of bleaching. Um, Coral Reef Watch is trying to uh, collect all the information we can on the, uh, the bleaching event as it's going on. Uh, if you can drop us a quick email to just give us a, a, an update of what's going on, preferably getting some photographs, uh, send them to coralreefwatch at noaa.gov. And then your, from your surveys that you do when you're out uh, looking at the reefs and you can give us uh, a more detailed analysis, uh, submitting these quantitative and qualitative questionnaire forms. It's two different forms with slightly different information that go together. And uh, you'll, you'll see when you get in there, the, it makes sense why there are these two forms. Please go through and submit your bleaching uh, reports. It really helps us in being able to improve our products and to better know what's going on in documenting this event as it unfolds. With that, uh, we'll be having questions at the end of the presentation. And so at this point, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Chris. Okay, Chris, hopefully you are receiving it now. I am receiving it now. Is everybody hearing me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Oops. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, again, my name is Chris Berg. I am the South Florida Conservation Director for the Nature Conservancy, uh, based in the Florida Keys. I am uh, one of a, a team of people that are focused on uh, conservation uh, for Southeast Florida, including the Keys, including uh, the area of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, the Palm Beaches, and even out to the Dry Tortugas. Uh, coral reef conservation is a particular focus for us, and I'm going to be giving you a description tonight of the Florida Reef Resilience Program, which the Nature Conservancy is, is very involved in, but which involves many, many other partners. So uh, Mark's been giving you the very big picture, and now I'm going to zoom in to, to South Florida. And this will focus on coral bleaching monitoring, but the program is, is broader than that. <clears throat> the Florida Reef Resilience Program uh, was initiated in 2004 as part of a uh, memorandum of uh, understanding between the governments of the United States, represented by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, the Government of Australia, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, and the State of Florida, who agreed that uh, understanding better the uh, concepts of ecological resilience and how they could be applied to coral reef management, conservation, and sustainable use would be a, a good use of everybody's time. And the Nature Conservancy quickly uh, stepped into that partnership to help coordinate the efforts, both with these three entities but with others uh, in Florida. The basic goal is to uh, identify areas that are most likely to resist or recover from bleaching or other disturbances, and to use that information and other information uh, for reef uh, conservation, protection, and management uh, strategy development and implementation. It is a uh, large and complex partnership. We've got, uh, again, the federal agencies that are involved, state agencies, a variety of academic institutions, 
and non-governmental organizations, uh, including the Nature Conservancy. Um, this uh, slide represents uh, organizations that are members of our steering committee, which meets uh, on at least a quarterly basis via telephone or in person to guide uh, the direction of the program. Here is a map of the region showing uh, at the southwesternmost area the Dry Tortugas, all the way through the Florida Keys, up along the southeast Florida mainland, and as far up as the northern extreme of reef building corals in Florida uh, to the St. Lucie Inlet. So I'm going to be focusing today on what we call disturbance response monitoring, in this case uh, warm water disturbance. Uh, that will be the bulk of today's talk. But the Reef Resilience Program also has a human dimensions component wherein we work with uh, the people that depend upon coral reefs for their livelihoods or for their recreational pursuits, as well as with uh, researchers, uh, sociologists, and others to understand how people benefit from these reefs, how they are both part of the problem for reefs in some cases, but also potentially part of the solution. We also have, uh, as part of the uh, reef resilience program and emphasis on raising awareness about the fact that climate change uh, is one of the underlying root causes of reef uh, decline in Florida, if not uh, elsewhere around the world. And then it's really loosely related, but we also have a big coral reef restoration effort uh, focused in the same region with many of the same partners, and we really uh, share information between what we learn on the monitoring side and what we learn in the coral reef restoration side to advance both strategies. So I'll be focusing on the Florida uh, Reef Track Coral Bleaching Response Plan, which has four components, as you can see here, uh, an early warning system, impact assessment, or the disturbance response monitoring, as I just called it, uh, communications aspects, and then management actions. So to begin with, I'll dig into the early warning system. Uh, this should look familiar. Mark just gave you a, a real thorough introduction to the Coral Reef Watch products. Uh, this one happens to be an example from uh, June 2015, where we were beginning to see uh, all around our region of interest, the South Florida region, alert level one through the Florida Keys and some alert level two along the Southeast Florida mainland. So early warning is critical for this bleaching response plan because it helps us prepare for uh, the conditions that are, that are predicted. Uh, it is uh, very valuable to us, not only in helping prepare the scientists, the divers, the people that are going to be doing the assessments, but also beginning to communicate with the public about the fact that uh, we, in this case the broader we, reef managers, reef conservation interests, have an understanding of this uh, threat to coral reefs. We can predict when it's coming, we can monitor its impacts, and we can uh, begin to uh, ask people to take actions that will mitigate those impacts. So uh, the coral reef watch products are critical, and so is the uh, program led by Moat Marine Laboratory, along with the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, called Bleach Watch. This covers the Florida Keys. You can see the area of interest here uh, in the lower right-hand side. So Moat Marine Lab collects uh, observations of all, from volunteers, people who are whether they're scientists or uh, reef, uh, reef uh, tourism operators or other individual uh, divers who can both report uh, bleaching, diseases, and other, other uh, symptoms of stress on the reef. And they can also report the absence of uh, bleaching, which is also very valuable information. So Moat Marine Lab then takes the uh, information collected by the, by the observers and combines it with uh, the results uh, that are available on the web from, from Mark's program, the uh, NOAA Coral Reef Watch, and provides uh, bi-weekly updates. On how are things now and how are things looking in, a, in the immediate future? That keeps us all apprised of, uh, of how things stand and how they may, may evolve and how ready we should be for an active response. That covered the Florida Keys, and then on the mainland, the Miami Broward County, uh, Palm Beach area, uh, a similar program managed by the state of Florida uh, enables you to uh, take your observations and describe them and plug them into the, a, a very similar system. 
So that was the early warning system in a nutshell. Now the impact assessment, this is what I'll spend a good bit of time on. Uh, again, I, I described it as disturbance response monitoring. We developed it very much with uh, warm water driven coral bleaching in mind, but we recognize that it can be used for other disturbances and it has been used for other disturbances, including uh, cold water driven uh, impacts on coral, including uh, bleaching and, and mortality. We also were prepared to use it when we had the big oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico uh, several years ago, but we didn't end up needing to, de to deploy the monitoring program. So uh, this program was designed to monitor coral reef condition throughout, throughout the entire range of shallow water coral reefs in, in the region to track uh, the occurrence and the impacts of disturbance. We've been doing this since 2005 all the way up through uh, recently completing the 2015 surveys. We've been doing it annually. And uh, it relies upon experts, people who are able to identify corals to species and identify the differences between paling and coral bleaching and uh, various diseases and other uh, things that look similar. Uh, predation, impacts of predation on corals, for example. <clears throat> And those folks, uh, those divers, many of whom are volunteering their time, uh, go out during the hottest time of the year. Uh, the peak of thermal stress in Florida is typically mid-August through mid-October. And then if we have a bad enough uh, coral bleaching event, we then subsequently go out uh, early in, during the, the cooler months of the year that follows to do follow-up surveys and see if bleaching is still present, if diseases have set in, or if recent mortality is present. So the basis of this uh, sampling uh, program is a spatial framework that really divides the Florida coral reef ecosystem up into what we call uh, the entire region, all of South Florida, uh, subregions like this uh, Martin County subregion here, or the Palm Beach subregion, and then many others. You've got the upper keys, the middle keys, the lower Florida keys, and so on. So those are the subregions. And then the blow up box here shows you examples of different zones. So you've got the inshore coral reefs, the mid channel coral reefs, the offshore patch reefs, the fore reef, which is where most of the uh, reef tourism, the big dive, uh, diving tourism activities take place on the largest uh, reefs. And then further offshore, the deep reefs. So you've got subregions running uh, up and down the Florida reef tract, and then these zones within the subregions. And within each of these, we know where the reefs are from previous mapping efforts, and we allocate the available effort, the number of uh, divers and dive time that we have available to cover uh, the entire region. We saturate and we do more uh, samples in zones and subregions that have more coral to get a better more representative sample. And that gives us an ability to uh, describe how the bleaching, the disease, and other impacts are, are occurring across the entire region. So what we do once we go to those sites, which are randomly selected every year, we, we don't go back to the same site uh, ever, unless, unless that happened randomly. Uh, the divers go down to their, their pre-assigned sites. They dive down and establish the 1 by 10 meter belt transects, and they do two of those per site. They measure and assess all of the stony corals that are larger than 4 centimeters. Uh, and then on large, uh, larger coral colonies, they identify the number of uh, different patches of tissue that remain from a, what may once have been a, a coral head that was entirely covered with tissue. They identify the species, as I said earlier. They identify the degree of paling, bleaching, percent recent mortality, and uh, different coral diseases, uh, the presence of those diseases. Then they go back. They enter the data into an online database, uh, which we can very rapidly query uh, for results. And here are some examples, or rather some images that show you uh, the scope of the program. Again, we're covering the whole region. Uh, the, the green dots in this uh, image represent all of the sampling, all the sites that have been sampled between 2005 and this year, a total of over 2,000 sites. And here's an example from last year. 
as Mark said, uh, we in Florida, in, in, in South Florida, experienced uh, warm water conditions uh, relatively early in this overall global coral bleaching event. And um, as you can see from the large amount of red on the map, red is a bad thing, uh, we partition the occurrence of bleaching and paling into three uh, categories. Green is mild, meaning 0 to 20 percent of the corals in that subregion or zone, or zone rather, are are pale or bleached. Moderate is 21 to 50 percent, and red is severe, more than 50 percent. So in this year, 2014, between mid-August and mid-October, uh, 172 sites were visited. Overall, some moderate to severe bleaching occurred in all of the subregions, and severe bleaching occurred from the Dry Tortugas all the way up through the Florida Keys and even into the, um, the Miami area. So the note here in the lower left uh, says we create a quick look report. That means uh, there's not a lot of fancy statistical analysis, just a basic report out where was the bleaching, how severe or mild or moderate was it, and then the same with disease and recent mortality. So that was 2014. This is a tabular way of looking at the very same data. Uh, the red, uh, I'm sorry, the left-hand column here is the subregion. The next column is the geographic zone, and then percent paling, percent uh, bleaching and paling combined, and the number of sites uh, within each of those strata that were sampled. So in the Dry Tortugas Lagoon, 19.55%, uh, uh, the, the prevalence was 19.55%. When you added, that, uh, added bleaching to that, it was over 70%, and that was based on 11 sites sampled, so 22 transects overall. And as you can see, that's, that's a lot of red. That's a bad year for us. In fact, it was the worst year to date uh, from, since our initiation of the program in 2005. 2005, in fact, was the most uh, recent very bad year. We've had a lot of uh, mild to moderate years between then and now. 2005 was looking quite bad for Florida, but then we began to see a lot of uh, tropical storm activity that cooled the water down and probably spared the corals from a lot of stress. So that's the tabular way of looking at it. As I said, when we have a, a bad year, we go out uh, in the following winter in the cooler months and, and look at corals to see how they're faring. Um, in this instance, we don't go and re redo the random samples. We go to what are called CREMP and CREMP sites. These are permanent monitoring stations with uh, pins fixed in the bottom that are monitored on an annual basis uh, for, uh, for other things, uh, really full, full on assessments of benthic uh, community structure. Uh, CREMP stands for Coral Reef Evaluation and Monitoring Program, and CREMP is the Southeast Florida version of the same. So we go out to these 25 fixed sites and, and look, we do our method looking for coral bleaching, paling diseases, and so on. And we were happy to see in 2015, early 2015, uh, January and February of 2015 to be specific, that uh, there was only a little bit of bleaching still evident and that there was no, uh, actually this particular map doesn't, doesn't show the paling. Here when you combine the paling in, you see that basically things had moderated a lot. There was mostly green, meaning less than 20% paling and bleaching. A couple of sites uh, in the yellow here that were moderate, meaning 20 to 50%. So between um, the end of, uh, or the middle of October 2014 and early 2015, there was a serious um, moderation in, in the prevalence of bleaching and paling. Um, however, uh, we did see uh, some recent mortality. So the red here is greater than 10% recent mortality. Yellow is 5 to 10%. Green is less than 5%. Uh, there were several sites uh, here off of Miami and here off of the Upper Keys where there was what we classify as severe, more than 10% recent mortality. But um, that was, uh, we were happy to see that because we could have expected more given the heat and given the prevalence of bleaching. Uh, disease occurrence was also very low. Here again is the, the tabular version of that map. And I'm just going to carry on. 
carry on to the present. So we just finished our summer uh, 2015 bleaching um, uh, disturbance response monitoring. We were able to hit more sites this year, 250 sites overall. We saw that it was less uh, bleaching and paling were less prevalent than last year, more moderate, the yellow color, although there were some red, severe, more than 50% bleaching in both the middle and upper keys uh, subregions. Um, I would say, though, that although you see a lot of yellow here, a lot of moderate bleaching, many of these were close. They were almost in the red or severe category, so it may be, uh, it may be underrepresenting the severity. So again, here's the tabular way of looking at the same. Here, uh, see this value of 48%, 47%, another 47 to 49. These are a couple. These are the examples where, uh, with just a, a little bit more, a few more colonies bleached in those in those sites, uh, or rather in those subregions, they would have been pushed into the red category, but they weren't. So um, it wasn't as bad as last year for, as far as bleaching and paling were concerned. But unfortunately, we saw very significant um, uh, amounts of disease. Uh, as Mark said in his presentation a moment ago, uh, once the bleaching is over or seems to be over, that doesn't mean the story is over. The corals may still be suffering from residual stress and may be more susceptible to diseases. Here we've got images of black band disease, which is, uh, you know, you see some of it all, all year long and some of it uh, every year on the Florida Reef Tract. The lower photo is um, white plague disease or white plague syndrome, which again, you see some of it, um, you can see it any time of the year and certainly you see some every year. But what we saw was a cluster of it, a really significant cluster of it uh, in the northern Miami-Dade, southern Broward County region here. Um, so, and then a little bit of, of severe or more than 10% disease prevalence and a few other sites in the upper keys and in the lower keys. So that is bad, uh, but what's even worse, I'm, I'm sorry to say, is that our monitoring really didn't pick up um, the disease while it was still active. What our monitoring mostly picked up was the recent mortality probably almost certainly caused by disease. And you can see the red, more than 10% prevalence of recent mortality really clustered around that same area of the Southeast Florida mainland and elsewhere. A lot of red on the map, a lot of recent mortality. Uh, so these corals probably uh, beginning to feel the stress uh, from 2014 and showing, at least as far as bleaching was concerned, a recovery uh, subsequently um, were really susceptible to diseases, and many of them perished. So that was um, that was uh, two years worth of the the impact assessment portion of the bleaching response plan. I'll just touch on communications and management actions, and then wrap this up. Communications uh, doesn't start when the bleaching is bad. The communication starts when when you believe the bleaching may be significant, you start to put the word out, or we start to put the word out through uh, email list servers and uh, on the docks uh, around the dive shops and through the various stakeholder groups that are focused on coral reefs in our region. Uh, and then these uh, three media articles from the Washington Post, the Miami Herald, and the, the Keynoter newspaper, keysinfo.net, all were really during the, the heart of the event telling people that we were seeing uh, and, and documenting significant bleaching and diseases and explaining why that was a problem and, and what people could do about it, if anything. And then, uh, we don't have this yet, but we will very soon be releasing the results that I just gave you a preview of in our 2015 Quick Look report. That gives us an opportunity to go back to the media, go back to the stakeholder groups, and explain uh, what we saw what we expect uh, to happen as a result, and what we expect uh, the people who use the reefs to do as a result, including uh, avoiding adding additional stress to bleached reefs uh, or diseased reefs, and particularly in the case of this big disease uh, outbreak, avoiding going to a diseased reef and then going on another dive immediately uh, to one that is not diseased and perhaps uh, spreading, spreading the, the pathogen. 
So some of the next steps, as I said, we'll be releasing the Quick Look report. That'll be on our website, which I'll show you in a moment. That should be coming soon within the next few weeks. We'll be following up with the media to tell them where this story is going uh, and, and what people can do to contribute to minimizing both the root causes of coral bleaching, which lead back to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and other things that cause global warming, and also avoiding uh, impacting reefs while they're under stress. Uh, we will report to the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council, the Southeast Florida Coral Reef Initiatives Stakeholder Group, and so on. Uh, this event was bad enough that it triggers our post-bleaching surveys, so we will be going out again in 2016, early in the year, to uh, look at those fixed sites and determine how the corals are doing and then reporting the results. And uh, before you know it, we're getting ready again for our 2016 surveys, um, getting the sample sites identified, getting the teams to know which sites they're meant to uh, survey, re recalibrating them or retraining them on the method so that they're, they're all using the same method, doing our quality assurance, quality control program. And then uh, beginning in August, they'll, they'll start the diving again. So it's a cycle. Um, you know, I've only touched lightly on management actions. What do you do once the reef is bleached or diseased? Um, this, this remains a, a vexing point. It's, it's very difficult to say with any certainty that uh, simply not going to that reef, avoiding diving on that reef is going to make a difference. And these reefs uh, in South Florida are very, well, many of them are very, very uh, important spots for tourism, for our economy. And it's difficult to tell people not to use them. But it's very easy to tell people that if they go there, they need to take more than normal caution in not touching the corals, not dropping anchors on the corals, not uh, going from a disease site to other sites and sp potentially spreading the disease, even though there's very little understanding uh, scientifically of whether or not there's real risk there, we can apply the precautionary principle and, and try to get people to take a, even more care than normal with the reefs. Uh, we will be discussing uh, opportunities for management actions and management interventions that can uh, minimize uh, stress on reefs while they're under pressure from, from warm water temperatures and what can be done at this uh, event, which is open to the public. Uh, we hope that it will be um, live streamed and available to anybody who has an internet connection. We're still working on the details for that. This uh, will take place uh, really January 21st is the day of the Scientific and Managers Symposium and Reef Users Symposium. This is in Hollywood, Florida, near, near Broward County, near Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we will be getting together and really celebrating the 10th anniversary of this program, rededicating ourselves to uh, all the hard work that goes into it, thanking our uh, supporters who include NOAA, the Coral Reef Conservation Program, the state of Florida, um, and many, many private uh, donors who support uh, the grant matches that, that, uh, for the public grants that NOAA gives us. Uh, and you can find out more about this at the frrp.org website, floridareefresiliencegram.org. Um, and we'll be revisiting the Climate Change Action Plan for the Florida Reef System. As you can see, this was a 2010 to 2015 action plan. We are, we are now at the end. It's our opportunity to look at which of the many actions we have accomplished and which we still need to accomplish and, and rededicate ourselves to. And the crux of this, if you go and download it from the website, is really that these global threats uh, make our local actions more important than they ever have been. We need to uh, deal with land-based sources of pollution, deal with overfishing, deal with acute impacts, coastal construction, and other uh, impacts on the reefs to give them the best possible chance to cope with the impacts of climate change. And again, I will reiterate that this is a real partnership effort. Lots of uh, public agencies, private organizations, and universities, as well as reef user groups uh, contributing. With that, um, I think we're opening it up to questions from myself and from Mark, uh, and your moderators will moderate. Thank you. So thank you both, um, Mark and Chris, for those presentations. They were very interesting. 
And I'd like to open up the questions on any of the presentations. Remember that you can either send me your questions or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Okay, so we have a question. Our first question is for Mark. And Mark, um, could you please speak a bit more about how do these tools incorporate factors that may influence local variability of bleaching? So that's actually a challenging thing to bring in. Uh, the, the tools at this point are based entirely on the response of corals to thermal stress and are calibrated based on the temperatures seen in that area. So the tools are, um, there are really two values that go into uh, our thermal stress products. What is the temperature now and what is the temperature that the corals normally see? And what we use for the climatology or what the temperatures the corals usually see is something called the maximum monthly mean climatology, or it's the average temperature of the warmest month of the year at that location. So this is calibrated to the location and has information built into it then on the temperatures that those corals in that location normally see. Now these products are, uh, the, the satellite products at this point are limited to a five kilometer resolution. And so there certainly could be finer scale uh, variability of what's seen on reefs from fore reef to back reef, uh, very localized um, uh, adaptation to uh, warm conditions, things of that sort that are not considered in these products. So this is one of the very important reasons why we need you to be taking observations of bleaching uh, and, and getting good location information because for local management, there may be the opportunity to um, use these data to identify areas where re corals are more uh, resilient or more resistant to climate change um, uh, or you know, have a be may have a better ability to, to bounce back after bleaching than uh, other areas. So we, we would love to have a lot more local information, but there's not a lot of local information in many areas uh, to build into the system. Okay, we don't have a lot of time for, for more questions, but I, I would like to ask one more question that was sent to us for Chris. And this one is um, the environmental research Institute, okay, no, I'm sorry, this one, the one for Chris, I'm sorry, is might it not be more accurate to say that the recent mortality in 2015, dear M. Keith service, could be from leaching or disease? Well, because we were not there tracking um, the fate of these corals uh, day by day, week by week, or even month by month. We, we have to make some assumptions. I think broadly our assumption is that some of the recent mortality is likely to be attributable to bleaching uh, where, and some is likely to be attributable to disease as the proximal uh, source of, of death, if you will. Um, however, it's really, we, we think of it increasingly as a continuum. So the corals are stressed. They are bleached, some recover and some don't. Even the ones that recover, however, are weakened uh, and may be more susceptible to diseases. And, and when we see a, a hot spot of uh, disease uh, and a subsequent hot spot of recent mortality, it's our inclination to, to believe that the, that the disease was the proximal cause, but it may have been bleaching that, that set that particular coral up for disease, uh, for disease in the first place. So um, that's, that's the complicated answer to the question. Okay, and just one more quick question for Mark. Um, what are the projections for the Malvines? 
for the Maldives, uh, we're uh, looking at uh, the very good chance of uh, severe bleaching this year. Uh, at this point, uh, I would be concerned that any of the reefs uh, in the Central Pacific, I'm sorry, the Central Indian Ocean uh, are likely to have uh, even more bleaching than they had last year. Okay, so I'm really sorry to have to wrap up the questions and answer sessions, but our time is up. Um, but we encourage you to continue the conversation of strategies for bleaching response on the Reef Resilience Network discussion forum, which is an interactive online community of coral reef managers and practitioners from around the world. You can go to reefresilience.org and click on the network tab to log in or join the network forum. And the questions that we didn't have time to get to today will be posted and answered there. Um, so here is a list of the resources that were mentioned by the presenters today. Uh, this will be sent out along with a recording of the webinar to the Reef Resilience Network email list tomorrow. If you are not on the list and would like to be, please email us at resilience at tnc.org. And also, please share it with any other manager you think would be interested. Please send any suggestions for future webinar topics to the same email, resilience at tnc.org. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And special thanks to both of our presenters, Mark and Chris, for those two great presentations.